speaker in the faculty lecture, lecture series. I'm Evan Bishashnik. He's our I guess, latest faculty member, newest, however you want to say that. Um, he, uh, he's uh, somehow trying to, as a young uh, researcher, straddle two different areas, which uh, you know isn't that easy. Uh, and um, so we're going to see today a little bit how he envisions trying to do that. He, uh, how, did he, how did he get to a point where he was straddling? Um, I guess uh, he, um, oh, he was probably you know, a hot, hot shot uh, science student in uh, Manhattan somewhere and went to the University of Chicago and did uh, computer science and ended up doing a research project on networking. And kind of funny story, his uh, graduate supervisor is actually now a faculty member in ECE, Matei. Um, <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so we really liked networking. It was a great project. And he went to UW as a grad student. And you know, they didn't really have anybody doing super core networking. And so, you know, but there were certainly some hotshot uh, systems people there. And he ended up hooking up with uh, Arvind Krishnamurthy and um, who else? Tom, Tom, Tom Anderson. And, uh, and he did a bunch of stuff. I mean, his master's work was. Uh, a piece of work called Scatter, which was super broad, you know, like global scale, um, key value store, where the kind of trick there was to get consistency while you got the scale and performance, and uh, got into SOSP, which is, for those who aren't in systems, um, the top systems conference. So that's not bad for a uh, master's thesis. Um, and after that, he did this uh, internship in Microsoft Asia, and um, there they were working on kind of distributed systems and making sense of them and uh, using model checking and he was really intrigued by that and he came back and took a course with Mike Ernst at UW who's a software engineer and got really excited by that and uh, that's kind of how he ended up being in the middle. So he said, oh, you know, really when you develop large systems like the system I just had for that SOSP paper, they're really hard to debug, like they're really hard to make sense of. And, um, and so as a developer, you don't have any tools and software engineers should help developers develop tools for making sense of their stuff. And uh, so we started off kind of building systems and realized that building systems is hard and, and it needs support. And uh, so that's kind of, I think, uh, my version, uh, very simplified, I'm sure, of uh, how Ivan is really trying to help us all just build bigger and better systems. So I'm gonna let him tell his story. Thanks, Phil. Phil just gave it all away. That's just, that's just all I do. That's what the talk is about. Um, it's kind of sad. Uh, so let me, let me start by introducing all these people that I'm listing on this uh, front page. There's a bunch of them. So uh, this, the stuff that I work on really involves faculty from a number of universities. So Justin Kappas is at NYU Poly. Uh, Yuri Brun is at University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Mike Kearns was my advisor, and he's at University of Washington. And then I'm working on this um, on these projects with Yan Yan Zhuang, who's sitting in the back, and she's my postdoc here, um, and she's a postdoc that I'm sharing with Justin Kapos. And then uh, Jenny Abrahamson was a master student that I worked with at UW, and she did her master's thesis on some of this work that I'll be presenting. And then Jody and all of our students who are here at uh, UBC that are working with me on some of the projects. So the topic is making sense of distributed systems. And so to start off, I kind of wanted to kind of like define what a distributed system is. And this is one of my favorite definitions. And it's by Leslie Lamport. Basically says, you know you have a distributed system if you know, when there's some kind of crash, 
uh, of a computer that you've never heard of, then you know, you're not going to get any work done. The problem is like a distributed system is one that is just very difficult to reason about. Right? So when there's a failure, it's, you're unable to actually conceptualize what went on and where the failure came from. So a great example of that, Gmail. So last week, we uh, had a Gmail fail. And uh, it turns out Gmail is a distributed system. So a lot of you experienced it exactly in this quote, right? Where on January 24th, if you were to go to Gmail, you would get a temporary error. And you couldn't get any work done. So you go on Twitter and you tweet about it. <laughs> so the, you know, the problem with Gmail is that it's uh, composed of many, many different services. They all interact in really complex ways. And as a user, you just have no recourse, right? You get this page and you're, you're dead in your tracks. You can't get any work done. So underneath Gmail, you know, it's really a distributed system. So a user request is forwarded to some machine. That machine forwards it to some other machines. And this particular bug had to do with a configuration error where you know, your request would get forwarded to a machine, but that machine would not respond back. So your request would go down a black hole. So this is, this is failure in the, in the distributed system. And the kind of overarching goal of some of my research is, you know, why does the distributed system behave in a particular manner? And for this statement, I'm taking distributed system to be this really broad term that encompasses, you know, network file systems. Hadoop, you know, is a distributed system that implements MapReduce. Uh, you might also have BitTorrent. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. It's more global but it's also a distributed system. And today I'll talk about projects that try to answer this um, by using techniques from instrumentation and analysis, software analysis. So by instrumentation, I mean that you can capture events and state in a distributed system. You know, you can capture the state as the system executes. And by analysis, there's a bunch of techniques that then look at that state. So you can try to mine the state that you've captured or you can do dynamic analysis on the actual code of your system. So in a nutshell, this is really what the talk is about. To give you a more concrete outline, more scary concrete outline, here's what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll be talking about four projects. They have stars next to them. And I've kind of broken them down by how much information about ordering you have in a distributed system. So the first project, NetCheck, is going to deal with a really difficult case where you really don't know any ordering information about your system. So in this case, you're going to have to reconstruct the partial order, which is how we tend to think about order in our systems. And then the lower projects deal with what happens when you're able to instrument your system and actually capture the sequence of events as they occur. And then what can you do with that sequence of events? It turns out you can do a lot. You can reason about when events occur, you can visualize things, you can really reveal a lot of behavior about your system. So let's start with the really first project, NetCheck. So NetCheck is uh, such, a, such a cool project that has slides of its own. So I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint. These slides, they are much more colorful, so I decided to stick with them. OK, so, so NetCheck project really deals with the problem that a user might be facing where they're using a distributed application, an application like Skype. So Skype is actually a peer-to-peer -peer application where you're connected to other peers that are helping your connection get to where it's going. And you might experience a failure as a user because the call might be dropped or you might experience poor quality. So what NetCheck will do is it will collect a sequence of events that your application generates and then it'll produce a diagnosis. And the diagnosis will be something like you're experiencing a lot of data loss. You know, and then it's up to you to go and uh, make that actionable. Like maybe get closer to a Wi-Fi spot or maybe plug in your Ethernet port. And the perspective in NetCheck is that you know, a lot of these distributed applications fail because of state that is not actually local to your system. So you're connecting through a really complex network. So maybe there's some network problem you're actually talking to a bunch of peers in Skype. So maybe it's a problem at some local, you know, at some remote peer that you're connecting through. So all of these factors obscure, you know, the behavior of your application. And so you have no, no way to actually understand it. And the basic idea in that check 
is to say that, you know, people who have built the application have probably made some incorrect assumptions. This is very common with programmers. Programmers like to simplify things. And so they say, oh, my network has zero latency. Or when I'm talking to a host, I'm actually talking to that host directly. There are no routers along the way. There are no metal boxes. I don't, I'm not going to worry about those. So these fallacies have been kind of reported by Deutsch. And so what we're going to do is build a model of these fallacies. It's going to be a model of an idealized network. And then as our network, as our application executes, we're going to compare the trace of the application against this idealized model. And then any deviations between the two will signal that there's a problem. So the cool thing about this net check is that it requires no application or network specific knowledge. So I'm modeling this idealized network and I'm going to take the trace as it comes from the application. So, you know, I have an application that failed. I'm going to collect a bunch of traces from multiple hosts that are relevant to my application. And those, those traces, I'll show you one in a second, will be system call traces. I'm only going to care about the the kind of the system level communication traces. And then I'll plug those traces into NetCheck, which is going to reconstruct the order and then use this idealized model to simulate the sequence of, sequence of events in my system and then classify uh, the fault, the likely fault that occurred. So the first step is to reconstruct an order. So for this, let's look at an example of execution. So this is at the syscall level. So these calls are going to be to the socket API, right? So this is your operating system that's going to orchestrate the network connection on application's behalf. So you have calls like, you know, socket or bind or listen or connect, right? This is the kind of your vanilla socket. So each of these is going to be a syscall invocation. And the invocation is going to include the arguments that you pass to the syscall as well as the return value. And so here we have two hosts, A and B. And so host A produces lines that are in red and B produces lines that are in blue. That's great. So if you have this order, you can kind of reason about what happened in your system. So you can think of this as the ground truth, right? In practice, what happens is that if you were to collect two logs, they're actually going to be disjoint. You'll get a log for each machine and you'll have no way to connect them. So you as a developer are going to have to reason about how, you know, what is the relative order of events between those two machines? So the underlying problem here is that you have one trace per host and you have no global order, right? Global ordering is difficult to achieve, especially when you don't know how many hosts there are that can scale. So the question is, how do we reconstruct what happened? The goal here is really to find an equivalent into leaving, right? It turns out that finding the exact uh, kind of sequence of events that occur is really challenging. And in fact, there might be multiple partial orders that might have produced this kind of view. Okay, so we're, we're going for a partial ordering that is going to give us the same kind of diagnosis as the real order. That's really what we're aiming for. So what can we do? Well, first of all, there's this local order. Well, we have this local order. If we have this global order, we know that it must respect this local order, right? We can't contradict the sequence of events that the host actually observes locally. So that's our first hint. The second hint is that we can actually use the semantics of the API. It turns out the POSIX API makes a bunch of requirements on the host, right? So if I make a connect and my connect returns a value of zero, which is success, it means that the other host was waiting for that connection, right? What it means is that if this other host is actually executing the sequence of events, then this listen where this host is put into a state where it's accepting connection must have occurred before this connect call, right? So that gives us another constraint that allows us to reason about the relative order of events between these two traces. You can do the same thing for other for other uh, events in this trace. So for example, send and receive. In order for this receive to return a value of five, I must have some data in the buffer. So the data must have been sent. So that means the send must have preceded the receive. So all of this is due to the semantics that are built into the POSIX API. 
So really what we do in NetCheck is we leverage the fact that the POSIX API constrains these traces in a number of ways to then reconstruct the global order. So just a note, so for example, if you take the two socket calls at the very top, there's actually no constraints between those two calls. So you can execute them in any order. That is, they're concurrent as far as we are concerned. So using a set of these constraints, we're going to derive an ordering that, is, that admits you know, at these, these observations. So that's the first step. The second step is going to be the simulation step where we're going to use this idealized network model. So idealized network model, again, as I said, basically encodes these fallacies that developers have about the network. So the fallacies will be things like assume transitive connectivity. If I can talk to A, A can talk to B, then assume that A, you know, I can talk to B. It's not always true on the internet, it turns out. And most developers assume that it's true because it's very difficult to actually you know, reason about it and do something about it in a distributed setting. So most people just say, okay, that's just gonna be fine. So you build this into your model and then you see where your simulation breaks. So other things that are built in are things like no middle boxes between me and the remote host. There's very low loss, right? So you assume that the things that you send are actually received on the other side. And then the simulator just simulates the invocation of the syscalls. So you can think of it as being a mini operating system or a mini um, implementation of the POSIX network API. So it, it sees that you're trying to create a new socket, it's going to allocate a new socket. It sees that you're trying to write some number of bytes, it's gonna write some number of bytes to a buffer. So it's going to simulate all of the trace events that you observe. So that's the simulator. And then the final step is the classifier. So it turns out that as you simulate these events, you can find deviations. So sometimes you won't be actually able to simulate this order that you've reconstructed. So that's gonna be your first clue that something's wrong. The second clue is gonna be at the very end of the trace. So you've driven your system to the very end and then you observe, oh, I had 100% loss. You know, nothing was received. So there's a, a, a set of classifying um, heuristics that we use to actually figure out what the fault what the underlying fault was. So evaluation for NetCheck, we've basically taken a bunch of bugs from popular applications. Things like Python, Apache, Firefox, there were a total of 71 bugs. We've created traces to reproduce these bugs, and then we've applied NetCheck to those traces. And we found that for 95% or more of these bugs, we've actually correctly analyzed them. Right? So we were able to reproduce the bug report. And then we've applied NetCheck to actual applications like FTP, VLC, and even uh, VirtualBox, which is a virtualization platform, and collected traces from these applications as they were running, and then we're able to characterize the faults that we were experiencing with NetCheck. So that's NetCheck in a, in a nutshell. I'm gonna go back to this, to this deck now. So the point behind NetCheck is that it diagnoses distributed applications and it relies on black box tracing. So we know nothing about the system. We're just going to collect the set of sequence, the sequence of system calls using something like S-trace. We'll assume no clock synchronization, we'll not modify the application. We're just going to introspect on what it's doing. And then we'll use this idealized network model and network semantics to reconstruct an order and then find deviations between what was observed and then what a developer would actually expect. So that's, that's the idea in that check. So we're not using any kind of order. Any questions about that check before I move on to the next thing? So presumably there are combinatorially many possible orderings and you generate a plausible ordering. You search through the other possible orderings that there could be. Yeah, there could be. Um, the, the nice thing is that we're really in this kind of point-to-point -point world where we get traces for each connection. And so even if, though you might have N hosts, right, we're actually dealing with pair-to-pair -pair communication. And those pair-to-pair -pair communications are what constrains kind of the sequence of events. So we don't really have to order you know, each event with respect to all of the other events. We just have to order this event with respect to events at the remote host. 
So that really shrinks down the space a whole lot. That's kind of the, the key, the key insight. Yeah. So uh, if an application uses a high level API for using the POSIX API directly, how much effort would it be to, to make sure NetCheck can handle that? I mean, is it like a formal specification of the API or dependency graph? What does it mean? Well, you know, in our perspective, everything boils down to the POSIX API, right? So you might be using a higher level library. It's still going to generate these system calls. But if you're a programmer, you probably want to understand the dependencies at the high level. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of um, understanding the diagnosis, um, the diagnosis comes in kind of two forms. One is, you know, the system call couldn't be processed because my state machine is in the wrong state. Or it's a kind of a much higher level uh, diagnosis which says there was complete loss on a, on a particular link. Or there was an ad box that translated addresses. So I think the higher level analysis you could still use. The lower level analysis you would need to translate higher up somehow. So that, we don't, we don't do that right now. Okay, so getting back to this kind of long outline. So we just looked at NetCheck, which reconstructs the partial order. Now we're gonna look at kind of like more white box approaches where we're actually going to instrument the system, collect the ordering of events in the system, and then use that explicit order. So the first tool is gonna to be ShiVector that's going to order events in the system. So that's the instrumentation part of the talk. Before I go into ShiVector actually, I'm gonna talk about, well, I'm gonna describe this thing visually, right? It's, it's better than that long list of bullet points. So, you know, again, we're in this log analysis space where we have three machines, they generated these three logs. Logs are very difficult to analyze. So what Chevector will do is actually it's going to add more information to the log. It's going to log the partial ordering of events. So from this partial ordering, we'll be able to do analysis. So the simplest kind of analysis you may want to do is actually just visualize what went on in my system. So this is going to be Chevette's. Right, so I have this DAG that's now encoded somehow in my log. I'm going to extract it out and show it to you. So the, this, you know, the idea is that this thing is gonna be way more useful than this blob of text in the middle. And then the other kind of analysis is C-Site, which is more, more advanced. The idea in C-Site is that you want to take these sets of executions and then summarize them even further. It's kind of like boiling them down to derive this more abstract model. And this abstract model describes the executions and hopefully it's much smaller, more concise than the output by Shibiz. So that's kind of the, the rest of the talk in a nutshell. So looking at Shivector, you know, to start with, we need to talk about concurrency and logging and such. So assume that you have a system with two threads, T1 and T2, and T1 generates event A, T2 generates event B, and then you have some kind of logging pipeline where there's a logger that sync, you know, serializes these two events and generates this totally ordered log on the right. So the question for you then is which of the following three systems generated the log? Right, so you may have a system like the one here on the left where you have a timeline for each of the threads and then the event on a timeline indicates that this is when the event occurred by the thread and then arrows between events indicate the happens before relation. So basically it tells you that event A happened before B, right? In the second system, there is no constraints between A and B, which tells you that the two events are concurrent. And then the last one, it tells you that B must have happened before A. So what do you guys think? Norm, don't say anything. <laughs> one of the first two. Eric? Oh, I was scratching my head, but I'm going to guess the first one. Graphics for the win. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the log is actually insufficient. You can't tell, right? Because it could be either the first one or the second one. It can't be the last one because that would induce a flip, right? You would require a B before an A. So, this is why we don't like total ordered logs in distributed systems because you can't make sense of the relative order of events. Right? This is why partial ordering is so important, which is why I'm gonna be talking about vector clocks for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so 
vector clocks are basically a way of reconstructing the partial order of a distributed execution. So instead of having this, these log line numbers that you use to figure out what happened, we're going to have vectors. And the vectors are going to be clocks. They're going to be logical clocks. And I'll tell you about how we actually derive these clocks. So this stuff you know, is from the 70s and the 80s. So Lampert was the first person to realize that ordering is kind of a big deal in distributed systems. And then vector clocks were invented in 88 and 89. OK, so what are vector clocks? So we're going to use this kind of three-threaded example. And I'm going to show local events as these kind of boxes or circles on these timelines. And then whenever there's communication, there'll be an arrow between two events. So initially, you know, we're going to have vector clocks that are set to all zeros. So a vector clock is a vector. It contains three integers because there's three threads. And so initially, we can choose any value. We'll just choose 0 as the value that we start with. Whenever you have a local event, you're going to increment your local vector clock. So I started with 0, 0, 0. Now it's 1, 0, 0, because this is the first event for thread 1. Right? So now if I have other local events on thread 2 and 3, I'm going to increment the relative vector clock for C and D. So it's going to be 0, 1, 0. So I incremented the second, the second index of my vector and the third index of my vector. So local is easy, right? I'm just keep on incrementing these clocks. And it's almost like I'm maintaining these separate timelines. Right? The clocks are, in some sense, incomparable. And I, you know, one thread cannot influence another thread's clock if it just has local events, which makes sense. Right? There's no communication between them. So the interesting things happen when you have communication. So if I have an event D, so I incremented the vector clock. It's now 2, 0, 0. And D happens to be a send. And my event E happens to be a receive operation. Then there's going to be transfer. And the transfer, this is going to be kind of like causality transfer. right? So now E happens after C. So it's going to increment its local clock. But it's also going to inherit this 2 in the first index position. It's going to inherit it because it's, E happens after D. Right? So it's just going to take that vector clock and set its local clocks to reflect the fact that it's receiving. So this is almost like knowledge transfer. right? We're just trying to track this partial order. And whenever there's communication, we're going to send across vector clocks from one host to the other. And the reason we're doing this is because at the very end, when you have this diagram, you are now able to compare vector clocks. So there's this mathematical formula that tells you that you know, a clock, clock i, is less than clock j, which means that clock i happens before clock j. If, for all of the indices, my clock i is less than or equal to clock j. And there's at least one index where it's strictly less. Okay, so to give you an example of this, here's a thread thread of events, A, D, E, F, H, I. And there's, here's the order. It's a total order of events. And it's totally ordered because it satisfies this, this relation. So it allows me to reason about events that occur between two hosts. Even though it's a distributed system, I have this total order on events in a distributed system. Also, it lets me reason about concurrency. So it tells me that the events D, C, and B are all mutually concurrent. Because not, this relation is not true for C or D, which are a way you compare them. So that's really useful. right? If you're a developer and you want two events to happen one after another, and you find out that they're concurrent, you know that you're in trouble. So what is Shevector? Shevector basically just does what I described. So you have some system. It outputs this log. It turns out to be a distributed system. So the system instrumented with Shevector is going to output the same exact log, but it's going to include these vectors. So at the very end, you'll see the vector. And here you have a vector of four integers. So there are four nodes in my system. So the idea is that it's going to capture the relative ordering of events in my distributed system and just going to output emit the same log. So as a developer, you can still interpret the log, but now it has this extra information. 
So that's Shevecker. Now what can we do with this, with this log now that we instrumented the system? Turns out you can do a lot. So the first step is visualization. So for this, I'll actually give you a little demo. So here's Chavez in a browser. And what Chavez is, is it takes a log, just like the log I showed you on the slide. You paste it into a, into a box. You click visualize. And then you get back this total ordering, this partial ordering of my system. So it's going to simply graph the DAG, which represents the partial order that's in my log, and helps me understand the relative order of events in my system. So these boxes at the top are going to be hosts. So this is an East data center, Alice, load balancer, West data center, made up log. And then the bubbles are going to be individual events. Right, so now I can, I can try to link the events to my log. So I can double click on an event and see which log line it corresponds to. Right, so now instead of looking at this log and trying to make sense of when things occur, I can look at this diagram instead and then think about my log in this more abstract manner. Think about the ordering of events in my system. So that's basically Shiv is, right? It's just representing this DAG. It's not doing anything else. So as far as Chavez is concerned, it's really, you know, just we built the prior work that people have done in the space. So Coons was one of the first people to actually do this in 97. So there's a bunch of interesting follow-on work that hasn't been done, which is what I'm excited about. So it turns out that for a distributed system, you know, usually you're collecting a bunch of, a bunch of traces. And your traces tend to be very large. Like for Hadoop, you might have a cluster of 30 nodes. You know, each of those 30 nodes is producing a bunch of data that you need to analyze. So the kind of the interesting future directions here are first of all, how do you abstract away redundancy or complexity from your log? So you may be interested in just a few features in your log. Or you have multiple nodes that are doing the same thing. So you can merge all of their timelines. Or you have events that always occur, so you can always shrink the events, and kind of bundle them together. You may also want to difference multiple executions or just visualize multiple executions. How do you do that? If I have 30 executions, I don't want to actually see all these 30 timelines. Somehow I want to compress them. Or, you know, if I have some specific feature that I'm looking for, like show me all of the timelines where host A communicates with host C, because that should never occur, you know, that might be a query that you will run against, against these traces. And then finally, it's interesting to reason about process state. So right now, I'm just showing you events as they occur. So it's not really reasoning about the individual processes and their states. So an interesting kind of research question is, how do you integrate state into these time space diagrams? How do you integrate it? How do you represent it? And how do you abstract it away? Because obviously, in the log, it's going to be very concrete. right? So that's, that means that it's going to explode and not going to be very easy to visualize. So that's Chavez. The second project, project is called Seasight. And Seasight attempts to do something way more complex. So I'll talk about it kind of at a very high level. And Seasight basically says, well, you know, you're always going to have multiple executions. And you're going to need to reason about them abstractly. So instead of kind of toying around with these partial orders as these diagrams, Let's instead build this more abstract model. Because we know there are three processes. And we have a bunch of model types that we can use to represent distributed executions. So let's just do that directly. Let's infer the model from the executions. So the reason you may want to do this is, again, partial orders are complex. If I have one log, I may be able to visualize it. If I have five executions, it gets more complicated. If I have 30, it gets even more complicated. So you need some way of summarizing this. So kind of another way of thinking about Seasight is that, you know, a log is pretty easy to create. You know, you can always instrument your system. You can always output a log. You can always make it as large as you want. But it's very difficult to use because it's very low level, very concrete view of the system. Models, on the other hand, you know, usually we create them manually. So they're very difficult to create, but they're super useful because they're more concise. 
they're more abstract. And they tend to be exact because of the mapping between the two. So the idea is to connect the two. Right? You want to take advantage of the fact that a log is very easy to create and advantage of the fact that a model is very easy to use. So Seaside in a nutshell basically says that you're going to extract temporal properties of events from that log. And those properties are going to characterize what happened. And I'll show you a couple of examples. There's, they're intended to be simple. And then you're going to use those properties to infer this more abstract model. The model is going to be a communicating FSM. It's a kind of a model type where you have one finite state machine per process in your system. And the finite state machines can communicate. They can send each other messages. You're going to try to infer that uh, automatically. And this is going to require some model checking because we're going to require that the model we infer satisfies the properties we mined. And this is where we're going to get exactness. Right? We're going to, our communicating FSM is going to characterize our system in kind of very general terms. And then in the very end, we can use these models for a bunch of things. We can show them to the developer. They can explore the model, connect it to the log. Or we can use it for further analysis. We can use it for test case generation, you know, a bunch of software engineering tools. So what are these properties? So in Seasight, we actually mine um, six different properties, five different properties. Um, here's the first one. X is always followed by Y. So in terms of the partial orders, here's what it means. If you have three executions that look like this, my X1, which happened at thread one, always, always followed by Y2, which always occurs at T2. So it's true for this execution. It's also going to be true here transitively, right? Because x is totally ordered with y. And then it's going to be true for execution 2 because there is no x. So it's trivially true. true. Okay, so this is a property that you would extract if you actually observe these executions. And then as another example, here's a property that has to do with concurrency. And it says x1 is never concurrent with y2. And you would mine this property whenever you have total order relationship between x1 and y2 for all executions. So they're never concurrent. There's always some kind of dependency between the two. But you don't know the direction, right? It's not that x always precedes y. It's not that y always precedes x. It's that sometimes there's always a relation, but you don't know which way it's pointing. So here, y is followed by x. Here, x is followed by y. Here is x followed by y again. So you basically mine all these properties, and then you want to derive a finite state machine that satisfies all of them. That's the process. So to give you one example for a system that we've applied Seaside to, here's uh, Voldemort, which is a distributed hash table. And it's a system that's used at LinkedIn. It's open source. You can download it. And a distributed hash table essentially supports these two high-level operations. You can assign some value to a key, and you can request the value for a key. So that's put and get. And so we've ran Seasight on logs generated with unit tests. And the resulting model is going to model the replication protocol for Seasight, for Voldemort. So the unit tests create two replicas. So here's replica one, replica two. And there's this client, which is driving the replication in the middle. And the, you know, this is a CFSM. Most of you don't know what this is. So I'll describe it at a very high level. Right? Here are these orange paths. These orange paths are specific executions of my system. And they're executions at three different nodes. And all of these executions describe the replication that is required to assign a value to a specific key. Right? So the client here is going to replicate the value by first communicating to replica 1 and then talking to replica 2. So that's one path. And then the kind of mirror image of this is the execution of the get operation, where, again, this client is going to first get the value from replica 1 and then get the value from replica 2. So that's an example CFSM that was extracted by CSight. So kind of the high level point, CSight uncovers the true model. And the model succinctly captures a three-node execution. So if I was looking at a bunch of time-space diagrams, Right? 
it'd be more difficult to understand what was going on than in this higher level model of replication. Okay, so future directions for C-site work. Well, first of all, it'd be really nice to make this scalable. <laughs> Turns out model checking is really slow. So it'd be nice to actually use uh, more approximate model checkers like SPIN that would derive this model faster and would make it work on larger systems. Other cool things you could do with these models are things like inducing executions, like actually generating tests. So generating tests in distributed systems is really challenging because you have to reason about state across multiple machines and they all coordinate, so you kind of need a model for how they talk to each other in order for the test to be reasonable. So this is what you know, these models are useful for. You can actually reason through the kind of interaction you're going to be creating, so you can reason about the test that you want or don't want. You know, the other cool thing to do here is to reason about process state. Again, we're kind of shying away from state because really what I did with Seasight is to model states in terms of sequences of events. So you basically think of your state as the sequence of events that occurred before that state. But it'd be nice to get away from, from that. And finally, it would be cool to use this for performance debugging. There's a lot of time information and logs that you can associate with these diagrams. And that would give you some information about what's slow in the system, what's fast, maybe difference, um, differential, differential performance. So my last slide. So the question was, why does my distributed system behave in a particular manner? And so I talked about uh, four different projects that try to get at this question. So NetCheck is this project that says, you know, you don't have to record anything. Just let me look at the sequence of network calls that your application makes at these different vantage points. And then I'm going to reconstruct the sequence of calls. And I'm going to use this really simplistic idealized model to kind of do some diagnosis. And then the next three projects require on knowing the exact partial order. So Shevector is the instrumentation engine that gets you the partial order. And then Cheviz visualizes these DAGs, really simple tool. And then Seasight is the more advanced tool that uses the same information to get this more abstract model. Okay, so these are the tools that I'm currently working on and a bunch more are in the bag. So thanks very much for, for listening. only very, very rarely, Seasight would, would get confused by, a, by a, an interaction that wasn't, didn't fit in the model. So, so the model you're going to be able to derive is not the one you'd expect to get. Even if that one, you have 100,000 interactions that work exactly right, and one that's wrong, you can't ignore the one that's wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah, Seasight would capture it in the model. And um, whether that's good or bad depends on what you want to use the model for. So if you're actually going to look at the model and say, you know, here's what I'm expecting and I'm seeing something different from that, that's actually useful. Right? Um, if you're actually going to use the model for further analysis, that might be bad because now you have a model that's not accurate. Well, it's accurate in that it describes the system as it behaves, but it doesn't behave, describe kind of the, you know, the system as it should be. So ultimately that depends on the use case. Is there any way to sort of subtract out those noisy kind of interactions? Is that yeah, true? totally. So I haven't talked about um, kind of the log analysis angle of this work, which deals with mining of the properties. So the mining of the properties right now is, is pretty brittle, uh, intentionally so, because that's not where the focus is. But you could actually use those properties to figure out which executions are unlikely, given what you've observed. Right? That, that's kind of a natural step for kind of the mining part of this work. Alan, you had a question? Yeah. Um, and at sort of, I mean, this is a fairly kind of at a philosophical level, right? Because you're starting with a software artifact. You're then ex you're running a bunch of executions, which is, you know, a very lossy sampling, right? This gets you logs, which is abstracted from those samples. Then you're mining properties from this log, which is, again, sort of the problem of induction. So whether those are the useful properties or the artifact of some bugs that happen to be there or whatever. And then you're trying to you know, infer FSMs based on the mined data, right? So you've got this series of sort of lossy, unfounded steps. Mm -hmm. um, 
have people tried and, and you know, what's the hopes of just starting with your source code and brutally abstracting it? I mean, obviously, you're not going to model check perfectly something, but just brutally abstracting it um, and just skipping sort of all of your work. <laughs> that would be great. Man, I, I would love if somebody put, would put me out of business and I wouldn't have to worry about TSA. <laughs> uh, the, the difficulty really is with the requirements, right, for doing that kind of abstraction. First of all, accessibility of the source code. Um, the fact that, you know, for a lot of these logs, you basically instrument the system. You don't have to care about what is, where it's executing or what stack it's running on. Um, the fact that a lot of distributed systems are built on top of log libraries makes this really challenging. Right? So if I build a distributed system now, I'm not going to use the POSIX API for my interactions. Right? There's a bunch of there's protocol buffers that Google has. That's what I'm going to use. Right? And those, are, you know, those package data in particular ways, they you know, use specific you know, transmission semantics and such for orchestrating an interaction. So that's part of the complexity. Also, distributed systems tend to have a lot of code in them. It's another, another difficulty. Um, I think really for Seaside to be very successful, you need to link it to the code eventually. So I'm, I'm getting to that point where I have to reason about the code. Because even for test case generation, something that I talked about briefly, um, you have to generate code right, for, to exercise the system. You can generate inputs, but at the very least, you kind of need to know how to start the system. So to do that, you have to reason about code. So it's, it's kind of getting there. Uh, I think the interesting part about Seaside is to see how far you can go without looking at code. Right? What, are the, what are the limitations? And you mentioned like the logging libraries. Are, are, is that fairly standardized? You could sort of know when the log outputs are being generated fairly easily? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, yes and no. There's logging libraries that people use, and people roll their own all the time. Kevin? I'm intrigued by what you had to say about uh, approximate model checking. Um, just at a high level, how would that change Seaside if you don't know whether the model checker is, is working? Well, what ends up happening is that Seaside uses a model checker that's, um, that may not terminate at the moment. So if you're running your model checking, you, it might just time out. So you end up with, with no model. Right? So the question is, do you want some kind of model that's an approximation? Or do you want no model because there's no way to model check it? Um, I, think, I think the answer is often yes, you want a model. Uh, because you are going to use that model for something else. And maybe the fact that it's inaccurate just means that the test you generate is not going to run and you'll move on to the next test. You know, so in many cases, it's, um, you know, so we're not using model checking for verification purposes, right, which is where you would actually care about completeness and you would care about, you know, uh, approximation and the problems of approximation. In this case, in this domain, that's not, it's, that's not a big concern. I mean, it seems like there, there are two kinds of errors you can end up with, right? You can end up accepting inputs that you shouldn't accept, and you can end up rejecting inputs that you should accept. And is there a way of driving the approximation so that it does the more benign of those two? Usually, accepts. Um, usually, it's driving towards things you shouldn't accept. It's accepting more than it needs to be. Um, I didn't talk about the actual process, but you start off with a more abstract model, and then you refine it down. So the more abstract model accepts everything. Right. And so model checking is uh, necessary to make it more specific to your, to your system. So it's, um, it includes more things than it needs to. That's the problem. Bill? Super practical. So for um, the ship vector, when you're adding, adding the vector clocks, um, you know, most, so you have to actually add that as part of the communication from you know, one process to another, whereas the native application is just sending, you know, application level communication. Um, and so how do you kind of envision, you know, you don't actually want to mess around with the application code, you'd like to kind of not have to do that. So how do you, how do you see that? I mean, that just seems like, it'd be great to have vector clocks everywhere, but if the application doesn't include it, you know, what do you do? Well, the, the instrumentation is actually transparent. So it's, it's transparent. So the, um, you know, basically you have an application that you've written, and then you link it against a library that is the shift vector library. But you have to, you have to run it. You, know, you wrote the application to link. 
That's right. You have to recompile it in certain cases. In you know, so so Jody's working on this, for example. So you know, for Python, it turns out that you don't have to recompile the app, right? So you just need to add a file in a particular directory, and it just adds your vector uh, vector blocks automatically. So it depends largely on the tool chain and the and the language. But the um, we're going for transparency and the fact that you don't have to worry about adding vector clocks yourself. And, the, and then you know, a lot of uh, applications they. They do super good logging, like Apache, but Apache will, you know, it'll, it'll print out the log on the response as opposed to, so when it gets a get and then does some stuff and sends out a response and it logs on the response, you actually, you know, that can completely screw up ordering the stuff. So how do you envision dealing with that? I mean, obviously Apache's open source and you get in there and make it, just right. make it log on, on the right stuff. But. On the right stuff. Yeah, so the, so the, the you know, the vector clock version that I described uh, has the explicit send and receive events, but you can associate the um, receive event with the next local event, essentially. Right? So you're kind of pushing down the vector clocks towards the next event. Um, it does indicate that, you know, if I'm relating two events, it means that some communication happened after this one and before this one, right? So there's some there's hidden some. communication that you haven't observed. Um, well, it's you know, that's still useful, right? It tells you that this event happened after this one at the remote endpoint. Um, a way to mitigate that, you can explicitly log communication events, but you know, I, I don't think those are actually useful to developers. I think developers want to use at their existing logs, right? That's what, that's what they care about. Okay, this is perhaps more of a philosophical question. So you gave this example of this Voldemort uh, distributed hash table where the code was the documentation, so to speak, right? You, you mentioned that there's no model and it was useful to infer. Right. So I wonder, you know, um, in, in systems where, which have developed in a more systematic fashion, right? Okay, maybe those don't exist, but suppose you started off with a high level model and then you describe that in a high level language and then compile it down to a low level protocol. How useful would this whole ecosystem be? Or would this problem just disappear and we don't have to worry about it anymore? Well, um, I, I think there's always a disconnect you know, in the development process between the, the specification that you start out with and the implementation artifact, right? It's always this approximation, right? Uh, one thing that this could be useful for is to actually, um, you know, give you a perspective, a more higher level perspective on your implementation and maybe compare that to the spec. So even if you have a spec, if you were to, uh, you know, derive this abstract model, you would compare it to the spec and say, did the artifact that I implement actually the thing that I want? And if there's a disconnect between the two, you, you have a log, so you have a counterexample to that behavior. So if you have a spec, it's actually super useful, right? Then the pipeline is, in a sense, complete because you have something to compare these models to. So that would be ideal. And unfortunately, <laughs> you know, distributed systems are not modeled as CFSMs, right? People basically model them by drawing, scribbling things on the whiteboard. So the, the reality is that we don't have abstract models for the things that we build oftentimes. Another totally different question on um, part of your abstract is about understanding. And you spit out models, let's say, in C um, But the question is do you see as part of your research program trying to understand how humans understand those models? So, for example, you know, for me, I've never actually liked finite solutions. I look at them and my brain just goes, ah. Like, I have no idea what that thing is doing. Um, and, you know, which is sort of to the point that sometimes models are too concise. Like the APL program that you write one night, you know, the next morning you don't know what it does. Um, so do you see that as kind of important, like getting to models that people actually themselves can reason about? Like, like maybe I'm... <laughs> I think that if you have a lot of expertise and you're working with a, a system and a model all the time, you eventually understand it. But um, just yeah, I think um, I, I am interested in developing new formalisms. That's one way of putting it. So uh, you know, Chavez currently outputs these um, these kind of time space diagrams. You can think of this formalism as you can think of this thing as a formalism. This is a way of describing or specifying. Yeah. interaction in your system. I think it's way more intuitive than CFSMs or a bunch of other formalisms that we have. Um, the, so I, I, I want to develop these things. The, 
think the issue is that whenever you introduce a new formalism, like there's a learning curve, you have to explain it and so forth. I think these are pretty intuitive. It's nice to use intuitive things. Um, ultimately, I'm a systems person though, so I think the, um, I only go so far with the formalisms, right? So I, I want to use them, but um, creating new ones and really actually exploring the formalism part of it is not my main, my main focus, I would say. Other questions? Yeah, so C site is a, is a peculiar beast. So the um, property extraction, property mining is really fast. So that's trivial. Um, unfortunately, C site depends on the model checking step, and that has almost an unbounded time associated with it. So that the time for that really depends on the complexity of the model. And initially, the model is really simple. So deriving a count example is, is really trivial. But the more complex and the more processes you have, the, the worse the runtime. So there's actually, we haven't been able to characterize it because it's, there's too many dimensions really for it. Um, I think we'd be able to characterize it once we use um, you know, more, more like bounded model checking with spin where you, you know, the ultimate problem with CFSMs is that they reason about these queues that may have unbounded message, uh, messages in them. So in, in spin, they basically bound the number of messages that can be outstanding in my queues. And once you bound them, then you can you know, limit your speed runtime. So um, once we use spin, I think I can give you a more concrete answer. outside of distributed computer systems where this stuff might be useful? Oh, interesting question. Um, <laughs> thinking biology, but... <laughs> um, so I think um, partial orders... Like the problem is we don't have very good traces of what happens, say, in a cell, but uh, it's a giant distributed system. There's a lot of concurrent it's events, right? Box. Yeah. Um, I, I, so. Well, there's also a lot of um, events with the origins. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, so I know that the um, at least in the software engineering communities, community these have been used for studying business process processes. So you can think of um, you know the various committees that we have, right, as multiple threads that are executing, and then whenever we communicate or send email, right, that's our synchronization point. So you, may, you can think of modeling uh, human activity using these diagrams. And you know, if you have your email track record, right, that's your vector clocks, you can derive that. Um, and then anything that happens within the, um, within the committee, right, that's kind of a separate concurrent execution. So these have definitely been used for studying business processes and, and human interaction. All right, well, you know where to find Ed, and he's on the third floor. What's your office number? It's uh, 327. 327. So if you have further questions, you know where to find him. Um, let's thank Ivan again. Really fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming.